Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for a, a discussion yet again of something which we seem to be discussing about once a month, namely what's going on in Europe. Um, we're delighted, though, to uh, be in, in the city for this one and delighted also uh, that Macquarie have uh, let us use their auditorium once again for CIS, CIS event. And thank you, Nicholas Moore, who's the CEO of Macquarie, who's here as well. Um, I mean, I don't know how many times you can sort of peel the banana or cut the orange on what's going on in Europe, but we're going to have another go tonight. And uh, Oliver Hartwich, who many of you heard, if you haven't heard him in person at CIS events, will have seen him on TV or heard him on the radio or read his, uh, read his uh, contributions in the press. Right, I'm delighted that we have someone, at least from that part of the world, with us to also to, to, uh, to uh, give his views. Daniel ben -Ami was invited out to Australia to speak at a conference in Newcastle and uh, decided to spend a bit more time looking at a place he'd never been to before. He's worked as a journalist for 25 years, during which time he's contributed to numerous national, specialist and international publications. His book, Ferraris for All, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a theme we love, uh, in defence of economic progress, was published in 2010. And it's only just making it here. We had hoped to have some available to um, for you tonight, but uh, apparently it's not uh, quite here, but it's almost here. And there's a paperback version, and I'll talk about that a little later. His book on global finance, Cowardly Capitalism, was recommended by the Baker Library of Harvard Business School. Daniel's a regular contributor to Spiked Online, and if you haven't re read uh, Spiked Online, uh, you should do so. Just Google it, you'll find it. Some wonderful material there with some, uh, uh, some friends and colleagues uh, of ours as well as uh, of Daniel's. And his works appeared in many other newspapers and magazines, including The American, The Australian Newspaper, The Economist, Financial Times, Guardian, and so on. He's appeared on numerous radio stations, including Counterpoint here, uh, Radio National, BBC, uh, Ireland's News Talk, and Hungarian Public Radio. Oh, that's interesting. Is that a, in, in English? <laughs> uh, television appearances include Al Jazeera, uh, their English version, uh, BBC News 24, BBC World, uh, CNN, Russia Today, and Sky News. Oliver Hartwich uh, is known to most of you. He's a research fellow in the economics program at CIS and uh, has been with us for three and a half years. His area of expertise includes uh, local government and federalism, urban economics, European affairs, of which he's become one of the, one of the Australia's experts, I think, in industry policy. He was previously the chief economist at the British Think Tank Policy Exchange in London. His publications with Policy Exchange mainly dealt with housing and planning urban regeneration and transport. Before that, he worked as an advisor to Lord Oakeshott of Seagrove Bay in the UK House of Lords. He studied business administration and economics at Bochum University in Germany. After graduating with a master's degree, he completed a PhD in law at the universities of Bochum and also here, uh, while working as a researcher at the Institute of Co uh, Commercial Law at uh, Bonn University in Germany. Um, Daniel will speak first, and then once he's done, uh, Oliver will speak and then we'll have as much time for questions as uh, your schedules and ours allow. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all and to Daniel if you'd like to speak to him. Thank you. Thanks, Greg, and thanks for the uh, invitation to uh, speak here, to speak about Europe a, a very long way away from the uh, continent itself. Uh, what I want to talk about is something that, in fact, isn't really discussed in Europe, which is the, what I would see as the structural reasons for the European crisis. Uh, this may surprise you. Uh, I mean, there certainly is discussion in Europe of uh, when there's a crisis, they might say such and such a thing is happening, uh, bond yields have gone up, uh, this is what politicians are saying. Uh, but certainly in Britain, and I suspect in other countries too, although I wouldn't claim to be a great linguist, unfortunately, there, there's very little discussion of the fundamental cause, or at least what I would see as the fundamental cause of the Eurozone crisis. And I really stated at the beginning and then used the rest of my talk to expand on that. Because the way I see the European Union, and particularly the Eurozone, which are the 17 countries which have adopted the Euro as their currency, is as a kind of top-down technocratic initiative which tries to pull together these 17 different countries 
into a currency block, despite the fact that these countries have very different levels of productivity and are very different in lots of different ways. Uh, so the northern European countries, obviously Germany is the most important, but uh, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Finland, relatively speaking, are very productive and strong economies, uh, whereas southern Europe, broadly speaking, Italy, Spain, uh, Portugal, Greece, uh, relatively speaking, are much weaker economies. And when you tie together those countries into a monetary block, which means not only do they share the same currency, but they share the same central bank, so they share the same short-term interest rates. Uh, they don't have identical fiscal policies, but they, they all, at least theoretically, uh, have the same fiscal rules that they're meant to follow. Uh, once you have that, you have all sorts of imbalances emerging, uh, which I would argue are really the cause of the, uh, uh, the crisis. It's not to do, despite what people will say, it's not to do with lazy Greeks. It's not to do with high public spending, although that has emerged as a result of the crisis, I would say more than being a cause of the crisis. There is this kind of real structural problem at the core of the Eurozone. Uh, I'm going to talk more about the economics of it. Oliver's going to talk about the politics of it, and we may disagree on details, but I think in broad terms we're probably in agreement. And I would also say that although we've kind of split it between us, and I talk about the economics, he talks about the politics, uh, you can't really separate them. They are really two sides of the same coin. So, yeah, I mean, just to really elaborate on what I've just told you, the, the Eurocrats, the kind of Euro elites, the leaders of the European Union, really don't want to encourage a public debate about the problems with, uh, with the Eurozone, which is one reason I think they're so keen on slagging off the Greeks in particular, because it's a way of diverting attention <laughs> from their own culpability in the crisis. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say Greece is wonderful and they've got a you know, fantastic political system. That would be ludicrous. But I do think that the, it is a kind of smokescreen, the amount of uh, derision heaped on, on Greece. Uh, and it's a way of evading these broader structural questions. Uh, so the Eurocrats, they don't want to discuss the, uh, the fundamental problems of the Eurozone. And anyway, they've got a pretty contemptuous attitude towards the Euro Euro ordinary Europeans anyway. So, uh, you know, why, why would they want to discuss it in public? There's nothing in it for them. Now, I should say that although I'm fundamentally opposed to the Eurozone and the, the European Union more broadly, uh, I don't share the, what I would see as a kind of little England uh, Eurosceptic critique of the Eurozone, uh, which you got from, I think, anyway, from Daniel Hannan, the British Conservative member of the European Parliament who spoke here recently. And I encourage you, you can go and see what he uh, said. He spoke in Melbourne, I think, at an IPI, IPA event. Uh, so you can go and see what he said. But from my perspective, his is a kind of little England uh, approach to the Eurozone, and it doesn't really get to grips with what's really wrong with it. Because it's all very well to talk about the Eurozone as a kind of giant tax and spend, almost quasi-socialist kind of entity. Uh, but even if you take that view, you have to get to grips with the specifics of what's wrong with it. And it is a very peculiar beast. So I would say, in fact, whatever pol political perspective you're coming from, you have to grapple with its very peculiar and specific technocratic characteristics. I would also say in passing that the uh, British Conservative Party is also has a, its own share of culpability in the whole thing. And I don't say that because I support the Labour Party, which I certainly don't, or the Liberal Democrats. Uh, but I think, uh, and I haven't got time to go into this in any detail in the speech, but I think the, a lot of the technocratic features of the Eurozone you get in British politics as well. And the Conservative Party in Britain played its role in setting up the, the Eurozone uh, and the European Union, even though Britain, thankfully, decided not to go ahead and adopt the, uh, uh, the Euro as its currency. Uh, and I also don't share the perspective that... Uh, you know, us Brits and you Aussies, you know, we're both part of the Anglosphere and we have affinity with each other. But those funny kind of Germans and Dutch people and, you know, we, we should really kind of distance ourselves from them. Uh, I mean, maybe he was playing a bit to the audience with that, but I don't share that. I mean, I, I feel a lot of 
uh, affinity with ordinary people in uh, Greece and the Netherlands and Germany and so on. Uh, I'm utterly, utterly opposed to the European Union, utterly opposed to the Eurozone, but I certainly do feel uh, part of Europe. And in fact, I think a reason to be opposed to the Eurozone is that it goes completely against some of the best things that have come out of Europe. So, you know, the Enlightenment, the ideals of, of reason and freedom and so on uh, came out of Europe. And I'm not using Europe here to mean Britain. I'm using Europe you know, more generally to include France and Germany and so on. So I very much feel affinity with uh, people in Europe and with a lot of European traditions, but I'm very much against the, uh, the European uh, Union, which is not to say that I don't feel any affinity with Australians. I'm not kind of trying to slag off Australians, obviously, but my... Affinity for Australians is not predicated on my dislike or me distancing myself from people who live in continental Europe. Uh, I think that is, a, that is a big mistake from my perspective. That's what I mean by a kind of little England uh, uh, perspective, which I would certainly distance myself from. Okay, so just very briefly, historically, how did the uh, Eurozone emerge? Uh, I would really put it with the end of the Cold War in the... Uh, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, a lot of people would trace it back further, and certainly the European Union has predecessors. There was the European Economic Community, and then before that there was the European Coal and Steel Community a long time ago. Uh, and although those organisations were far from perfect, you know, I wouldn't make a big deal out of opposing them. And, and certainly to the extent that they facilitated free trade and free movement of labour, you know, that's fine. I think the, the European Union specifically, in its modern form, uh, comes out of that period of the end of the Cold War. Because you had various different th factors happening at the end of the Cold War, which I think informed the movement to create the Eurozone and the, uh, the European Union, as it became known. Uh, first of all, well, you had German unification. O obviously, w w once you had the Iron Curtain coming down and Europe becoming united, that immediately put the prospect of German unification on the agenda. And it was something that the French and British were very nervous about, uh, and they couldn't really stop it, but at the same time they wanted to contain it. So part of the drive to set up the European Union, uh, which happened in the, the, the Treaty of Maastricht in the Netherlands in 1992, and then was, actually came into effect in 1993, but the drive behind it uh, came to a large extent from France and Britain because they wanted to, they saw Germany had to be united, but they wanted it to be, to be contained within this integrated European project. So Britain at that time under a Conservative government uh, played a key role. So although it opted out later on from the euro currency, it played a key role in this new kind of technocratic setup that was being created that a few years later became the uh, Eurozone. There's one other side of the story which I think is central to the uh, whole Eurozone setup, uh, which was that it became much harder for politicians in uh, European countries, including Britain and France, to know what they stood for. It was very easy for them in the, in inverted commas, the good old days to say, uh, you know, we, we're not the Soviet Union, you know, we're different, we're better. Uh, that was quite easy for them because the Soviet Union, in many respects, provided a kind of negative example which they could look good relative to. But in a way, for them, the disappearance of the Soviet Union was, was a problem because it was much harder. It meant they had to stand by their own record, you know, by what they did, rather than try and compare themselves to the very negative example of the Soviet Union. Uh, so they really came to the conclusion that more and more they should devolve power or they almost like abdicate responsibility to Europe, what became European Union institutions. Because I would say a key driver of the European Union really is politicians in the uh, European countries abdicating their own responsibility to lead and in many respects giving it, giving it away to the uh, institutions of the European Union, like the European Commission, which is the executive body of the European Union. So that's the historical backdrop. I suspect Oliver will probably talk more uh, about that, and we can certainly discuss it more. 
Now, the, the Eurozone itself came into being in the late 1990s. Uh, and just to make it simpler, uh, I'm going to oversimplify a bit, but just imagine it divided into Northern Europe and Southern Europe. So clearly there are slight differences between different Northern European and Southern European states, but I don't think we need to concern ourselves with those differences at the moment. Uh, Northern Europe, generally speaking, is uh, high productivity, uh, heavily dependent on exports, uh, obviously Germany at the core, and then Netherlands, quite important as well. That's the kind of setup in Northern Europe. Uh, Southern Europe, again, generalising a bit, but... Ireland, if you can geographically call that part of Southern Europe, uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy. Uh, generally speaking, uh, less productive, uh, weaker economies. Uh, so you had the kind of fundamental differences, and the Eurozone project was trying to weld them together. There are certain myths about the differences between the two sides. I mean, the, the myth, for example, of lazy Greeks, which I think is just Nonsense. I mean, if you look at the OECD figures you know, from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, according to the official figures, for every two hours that the, an average German works, an average Greek person works three hours. Now, you can say there are problems with the figures. So, for example, there's more part-time work in Germany, uh, more people are self-employed in Greece. But even if you take those things into account, I think it's pretty clear that in terms of working hours, and also in terms of when, pe on average, when people uh, uh, retire, there's not, in fact, a great difference between Greece and Germany. I don't think that is re really the difference. It's, the key difference is much more on the level of productivity. So what happens when you weld these two countries? Let's just call them, well, simplify it to two countries, northern and southern Europe, and forget about the ones in the middle, like France, at the moment. What happens when you try to weld them together in a monetary block? Well, on one side, in southern Europe, uh, you get a credit bubble emerging because it, it means that uh, the southern European countries could raise credit uh, much more cheaply than would otherwise be the case. This is until the crisis emerged in 2009, 2008, when clearly things began to change. But it meant that Greece and Spain and so on, their credit was viewed as being underwritten by Germany, so they could get credit much more cheaply. Uh, and I would argue it was that that really created the basis for the credit bubble, which later on burst and caused all sorts of problems. Uh, then in Northern Europe, strong exporting countries, remember, you have, in effect, their exports being artificially subsidised, in a way, because they... The, if you take the Deutschmark, uh, the, the Deutschmark would have been a much stronger currency than the euro, which became Germany's currency. Uh, because Germany was tied into this broader kind of currency block, uh, its currency was weaker than it would otherwise have been, which meant that, in effect, its exports to the rest of the world, both internally within the European Union, uh, so to Greece, exports to Greece and Spain and so on, but also externally, uh, its exports were much cheaper than they would otherwise have been. So for several years, this relationship went on, and it apparently was very good. Apparently, I underline. So uh, it, it's quite funny that a lot of the people criticising Greece now and Spain now, uh, back earlier in the last decade, were saying, oh, this is great. You know, the European Union and the Eurozone is really good because these, other, these countries are really booming, uh, and that's a result of the, having the common currency, and that's really good. Uh, and these are the same people, very often, who are now saying, oh, it, was all, you know, it is all problematic, and the Greeks and the Sp Spaniards are behaving very badly. So what you had, really, was a setup where both sets of countries, the North and South, were really prevaricating about dealing with their own <laughs> economic problems. That Southern Europeans were benefiting from cheap credit, which then burst, uh, the credit bubble burst. The Northern Europeans were apparently doing very well because their exports were very strong, but that was partly because their currencies were uh, weaker than they would otherwise have been. So although it appeared very good for a few years, I think it was inevitable that sooner or later it was going to burst and go horribly wrong. Uh, 
And in fact, the surprising thing to me is how long it went on. You know, it seemed to go on pretty smoothly for quite a few years before it really burst. That, if anything, has to be explained. To me, that's what needs to be explained rather than the fact that it eventually, really from 2009 onwards, it went horribly wrong. Uh, the, the difficult thing to explain is how, how it kept on for so long. So really, just to draw things to a close, uh, to talk about the problems that have been apparent since everything started to go wrong in 2009, 2010, I think you've had a few trends that have been very apparent. You've had the Euro elites prevaricating about dealing with the structural problems. So they've tried to deny there are problems. They've tried to extend credit. They've had these bazookas. I don't know if you've heard about these, but kind of uh, lines of credit that are meant to help deal with problems. But they haven't addressed structural problems at all. They've... Uh, tried to introduce what I would see as more and more undemocratic measures so that sovereign European states, which have elected leaders, uh, are meant to be subject to more and more strict rules from unelected Eurocrats, which I would see as a complete anathema to democracy. And you can see the apogee of this in uh, Greece and Italy, where now you have unelected governments. Uh, in charge. Uh, and it really strikes me, it's really horrific uh, how little criticism of this there's been in Europe. Because people say, you know, the previous the politicians were corrupt, you know, Berlusconi in Italy was corrupt, and uh, we really need economic experts to, to deal with the problems that we face, and very little criticism of the fact that there's a fundamentally undemocratic principle there where you have unelected governments in uh, Greece and in Italy. And as it happens, it was the Eurocrats and the experts who set up this arrangement in the first place. It wasn't elected politicians. Where elected politicians went wrong was much more just handing over power to the unelected Eurocrats. But to blame the crisis on democracy, I think, gets things completely the wrong way around. And then finally, you have Greece becoming a real moral whipping boy, where everyone is saying, you know, look how terrible Greece is and hugely uh, punitive measures are being used against Greece, I would say much more as a way of blaming it for the crisis than any kind of attempt to find a rational solution to find the... Uh, it's not about any kind of attempt to find a rational solution to the problems that it faces. It, of course, it does face some re very real problems. Uh, I was going to say a bit about the global impact, but I, I won't do that, except to say that... Uh, Although I can understand people here are probably interested in the question of what impact will this have on the rest of the world, I think it is important to interrogate what I've said because obviously if I'm, if I'm wrong about my general analysis, then what I, whatever I say about the impact on the rest of the world would be wrong as well. So I think logically you first of all need to look at the problem inside Europe before talking about the impact on uh, China and America and the rest of the world economy, although that certainly is legitimate. Uh, item for discussion. So I think I'll leave it there and hand it over to Oliver, who I think is going to talk more about the political side of things. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the European crisis we've been witnessing from afar for the past three years is not just an ordinary recession. It is not even an ordinary depression, and in fact, it is not even an ordinary economic crisis, I would argue. Daniel ben has succinctly explained the fundamental economic problems facing Europe today, and I must say I completely agree with his analysis. So rather than repeat his thoughts on the economy, I will instead talk about the political dimensions of Europe's crisis. Having a British journalist and a German economist here at an event on Europe and Australia is, of course, quite an intriguing combination. And having us agree on most issues is even more surprising. That is because when Brits and Germans talk about Europe, they usually mean very different things. On the British side of the channel, Europe is thought of as the European Union monster. So the bureaucratic authority that robbed the British of their imperial measures, threatens to disallow them from calling Cadbury bars chocolate, and can in no way substitute for the lost empire over which the sun never set. When the Germans talk about Europe, they have something completely different in mind. It's the place that for a long time after the Second World War had offered them 
a kind of ersatz identität, a substitute identity. And for very obvious reasons, being German was deeply embarrassing after 1945. But being entirely without a collective identity was not quite a pleasant option either. So the Germans were happy to relinquish their old nationalism and seek refuge in the construct of a European identity. And here's a simple test you can apply on someone who strikes you as somehow German. Ask him where he's from. If his answer is Europe, then you know that he is from Germany. <laughs> Because no Frenchman, no Italian, no Spaniard, and least of all an Englishman would ever dream of calling himself European. So the European Union was a bureaucratic intrusion for the British, and it was a self-help group for the Germans. <laughs> but what was it to the other nations in Europe? I would say it was an insurance policy to the French, who are forever afraid of their big and uncultured neighbor to the east, Germany, of course. It was a get-rich-quick scheme for the Irish and the Greeks. It was the only way for tiny Luxembourg to become a diplomatic superpower. <laughs> and it was a source of regional subsidies for Italy. And for all the politicians past their use-by date, the European Union was a comfortable early retirement home. If there had been no European Union, it would have had to be invented just to provide employment for the likes of José Manuel Barroso, Martin Schulz, Catherine Ashton, and Hermann van Rompuy. But polemics aside, it makes sense to see the European Union as what it is and not as what it wants to be seen. It is not an enlightened structure based on noble virtues, void of any national interests, free from the ugly world of politics. It is not a benign project to promote perpetual peace and international understanding. Deep down, the European Union is a product of plain and simple realpolitik, dressed in the language of progressive supranationalism. It is worth recalling the way the European Economic Community, the predecessor of the European Union, came into being. Of course, there was a genuine spirit of reconciliation in the 1950s, particularly between France and Germany. The two countries had gone to war three times in less than a century, and the younger generations on both sides wanted to overcome this brutal rivalry. This is the official founding myth which the European Union likes to emphasize, but it is not the full story. What really happened in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War was a lot less romantic. The main lesson from the interwar period was that punishing a defeated Germany had ended in disaster. So to avoid repeating the mistakes of the Versailles Treaty, they chose a different approach. Instead of controlling Germany by isolating it, humiliating it, and punishing it, Germany was to be integrated into a European framework. And seen from this perspective, it is immediately clear why European integration started with the European community for coal and steel. The key industries of coal and steel were, of course, crucial for energy and defense. Any attempts of German remilitarization could be thwarted quickly just by keeping a close eye on these two industries. The rise of Soviet communism was another factor that supported moves towards Western European integration. The confrontation between East and West led to the formation of blocs with clearly delineated spheres of influence. The US-led West confronted the Soviet-led East, and this confrontation reinforced regional integration on both sides. Most visibly, of course, the forces of political confrontation played themselves out through military pacts, such as NATO and the Warsaw Pact. But the rivalry of the systems also occurred on the economic battlefield, such as the Marshall Plan and the European Economic Community in the West, against the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, also known as the Comic-Con, in the East. A policy of demilitarizing and weakening West Germany would have been counterproductive from the point of view of Western powers. It was far better to make West Germany a valuable ally in the Western European uh, bulwark against the Soviet threat. And this also explains, by the way, why the United States actively encouraged the process of Western European integration from the very beginning. It was not just, to quote Henry Kissinger, the wish to have only one phone number to call Europe rather than consulting several dozen foreign ministers. The Americans were trying to solidify the Western Front against the Soviet sphere of influence. It makes a lot more sense to consider the foundation of European institutions in this light rather than pretend it was some innocent pan-European get-together. It wasn't. It is fair to say the idea of European integration was a product of the Cold War.
Of course, the process of European integration in Western Europe soon developed a dynamic of its own, moving away from its initial function as a tool within the Cold War framework. However, this does not mean that the events of the following years were less driven by power politics. And this leads us straight to Europe's monetary crisis. Just as with the founding of Europe's integration project, there are a few myths surrounding Europe's monetary union as well. If you believe the somber declarations of European politicians, the euro was meant to deliver all sorts of economic benefits to the continent. It would increase competition in European markets. It would improve price transparency across borders and it would reduce transaction costs. But once again, if you look more closely, you will find that behind the facade of supposedly good economic policy, other interests were at play. In this context, I would recommend the recent book, The End of the Euro by Belgian economic journalist Johann van Overtveld. It contains a long chapter on the prehistory of the Euro that reads a bit like a crime story. Its plot is about the fight over economic and monetary policy in Europe. At its heart was the question of which nation should determine the shape of economic policy in Europe and whose economic uh, philosophy should prevail. And the euro really was just the end product of this fight. The story is complicated, but it can be summarized like this. In the first half of the 20th century, Germany had experienced two periods of extreme inflation. The first happened in the Weimar Republic, and the second was after the Second World War, when the old Reichsmark became virtually worthless. In both cases, new currencies were introduced, but German savers twice lost a substantial share of their capital in the process. As a consequence, West Germany put great emphasis on the need for monetary stability. When it came to inflation, the Germans were twice bitten, but a million times shy. So they established a new central bank, the Bundesbank, and gave it complete independence to achieve its sole task of ensuring price stability. With its focus on fighting inflation in its tracks, Germany was different from many European countries. In France, Italy, and Britain, there never was the same orthodox commitment to monetary puritanism as in Germany. And therefore, other European countries were under constant pressure to devalue their currencies against the strong and hard Deutsche Mark. Unsurprisingly, Germany's economic dom dominance did not please its neighbors. In the second half of the 20th century, West Germany certainly wasn't a military, military threat in the region anymore, but it was an economic threat, and it was often seen as an economic bully. In his chapter on the prehistory of the euro, Overtfeld explains quite eloquently how the idea of a monetary union for Europe was born under these circumstances. And he also shows how unpopular this idea had always been with Germany's political and economic elites. They clearly understood that monetary union was meant to curb, or at least to contain, the intra-European power. And perhaps the other European countries would have never succeeded in beating Germany and its powerful Bundesbank into submission if it had not been for Germany's reunification. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl was eager to seize the moment and unite the two parts of his country. But to do that, he had to overcome enormous resistance. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was fiercely opposed to the reunification process, as was French President François Mitterrand. There's now good evidence of a deal struck between Germany and France at the time. France would accept the creation of a united Germany in return for a German surrender on the monetary front. And so the Deutsche Mark was sacrificed, ultimately, on the altar of German unification. Once again, the narrative of morally superior motives allegedly guiding the actions of the European Union falls apart. The introduction of the euro had nothing to do with rational economic policy or realizing some imaginary efficiency gains, but it had everything to do with the struggle for power by European nations. The lofty and idealistic myths perpetuated to make the European Union look more palatable always acted as a facade to ongoing power struggles. But looking behind this facade, we can see the current European crisis in a clearer light. Some non-European observers are always surprised why Europe ever embarked on an economic adventure as crazy as uniting completely different countries like Greece and Germany, Spain and Estonia under one currency. But perhaps it wasn't so crazy after all. To be clear, it didn't make any economic sense, but it certainly followed the inner logic of European integration, which had always been driven by considerations other than economic efficiency. It is high time commentators on Europe take the gloss of the European project. Way too often, European politicians are getting away with false declarations of European solidarity, joint responsibility, and historical duties, when in fact, they're just pursuing national interests. <laughs>
take Germany's actions in the Euro crisis. Chancellor Angela Merkel keeps repeating her mantra that Europe will fail if the Euro fails. She assures the Greek people of German solidarity in return for Greek commitments to fiscal discipline, of course. And she also elevates the whole question of saving the Euro to a question of war and peace. All this strong rhetoric disguises the fact that the whole exercise of saving Greece has nothing to do with war and peace. In fact, it is not even about Greece. The theater surrounding the Greek bailout packages deep down is about something else. It is about saving banks, insurance companies, and pension funds that had invested money with Greece. It is about not risking the reintroduction of a German currency. If that happened, the French would feel threatened again, while the Germans would lose the competitive advantage of an undervalued currency. And that is something that the Germans, the world's second largest exporter after China, are deeply afraid of. So Greece had to be saved because it benefited everyone else. And this also explains why saving Greece is not the same as helping Greece. How could Greece be helped by keeping it in the Eurozone? Two years of bailout packages and austerity programs have proven the failure of this approach to solve the Greek problem. That it is being continued clearly shows it is not about Greece. This points to an even more fundamental problem about the European Union in its current form. What it seeks to achieve, it mainly does because it suits the interests of individual member states. But the structure that it has chosen for itself is the structure of a nation state. The institutions of the European Union certainly resemble those of a nation state. There is a government in the form of the European Commission. There is a legislature in the form of the European Parliament. And there is a judiciary in the form of European courts in place of high courts or supreme courts. There is only one problem with this. The institutions of a nation state first and foremost require a nation. And for a true democracy to work, you need a demos, a people. The European Union doesn't have a people. No one self-identifies as European, with the possible exception of those Germans still ashamed to be, well, German. But the majority of Europeans self-identify as Czechs, French, Swedes, or Italians. Mark Stein recently summed up Europe's problems quite wittily when he said the core problem was that it was impossible to convince the Swedes that the Greeks were not foreigners to them. <laughs> Sounds trivial, but that's indeed the fundamental problem. Making the European Union work would require first overcoming the national and cultural differences within the continent. I would argue that it is undesirable in any case to do that, but I also believe that for all practical purposes it is virtually impossible. Observers have often said that monetary union cannot work without fiscal union, and that's true. But for any fiscal union to be accepted by the public, it takes much stronger bonds between citizens than those currently present at the European level. In nation states, there is usually a degree of horizontal fiscal equalization. In non-technical terms, it means the wealthier parts of the country are supporting the poorer parts of the same country. Think of northern Italy's contributions towards the southern Italian mezzogiorno. Think of West Germany's transfers to East Germany after unification. Think of South England's support to much poorer places in North England, such as Liverpool. Think of the redistribution between the states of Australia. Even within nation states, such horizontal fiscal equalization procedures are often controversial. There's growing unease in West Germany about funding the East, particularly as there are now some East German cities that look prettier than some parts of old West Germany. Resistance against subsidies for the Mezzogiorno, the poorer southern Italy, led to the rise of the separatist Lega Nord party. But if horizontal transfers are that tricky, even Within nation states, they are even more unpopular in an artificial construction lacking a people with a shared sense of community. In the last vote on the Greek bailout, Chancellor Merkel could not even get a parliamentary majority of her own coalition and had to rely on opposition support instead. In the Netherlands, the right-wing populist party of Gerd Wilders has called for a Dutch withdrawal from the euro. In France, presidential candidate François Hollande has signaled his opposition to further rescue packages. So there is growing resistance to the official EU policy of trying to keep the euro alive at all costs. But once again, it all comes down to conflicting national interests. Is it more expensive to deal with the breakup of the euro, or is it more costly to actually keep it? Do strategic national considerations justify contributions to countries like Greece and Portugal, or is it too risky to reintroduce national currencies? The European Union has always been a stage where the member states have struggled for power and they have struggled over conflicting interests. And this is how the European Union got into its current mess. And this is also why it is so difficult now to predict what is going to happen in the Euro crisis next. Unfortunately, 
the consequences of Europe's economic disaster go well beyond the economic sphere. At risk is also what the European Union always claims to have achieved and established, the framework of peaceful cooperation between Europe's nations. And it would be a tragedy beyond imagination if the Euro crisis saw a return to the political hostilities that have shaped so much of Europe's long and bloody history. And it would be ironic that the European Union, which was founded on the pretension, at least, of overcoming this brutal legacy, would be ultimately responsible for the revival of nationalism and radicalism across the continent. That would be a real tragedy for Europe, and it would be far worse than the economic calamities that the continent and the world is experiencing at the moment. Thank you.